If you are waiting for the IRS to issue additional guidance on cryptocurrency, I've got some advice for you. Don't hodl your breath. We'll try to fill in some gaps on this episode of Taking Shelter. I'm your host, Peter Paulson. We're going to talk about the tax consequences uh, around seven areas. Number one, buying and hodling or buying and holding. Number two, selling or exchanging for another virtual currency. Three, forks and airdrops. Four, mining Bitcoin or other proof of work uh, tokens, currencies. Uh, five, receiving rewards or otherwise staking proof of stake currencies. Six, uh, creating and selling non-fungible tokens, which is all the rage now. And seven, uh, we'll talk about deductions. We'll get some insight from you, Matt, on deductions, hacking, slashing, losing your private key, or other bad things that can happen in the crypto area and how you might be able to take some tax advantage from, from those items or from those events. My guest today is Matt Costa of Bestgate Wealth Advisors. Matt is a certified financial planner. He is a CPA with a lot of crypto clients and he's an active crypto investor himself. First question, Matt, why are you not in Puerto Rico? Have you not watched my other videos talking about how Puerto Rico will give you a 0% tax rate to encourage you to take your wallet down to the island? But seriously, Matt, you've got, you know, your own, you've been in this a long time. You've got your own crypto pizza stories. Did you ever think that it would get this big? You know, I certainly have some suspicions. There's no such thing as a sure thing, but you you look at what Bitcoin solves, some digital scarcity. And in a world today where there's debt-based currencies, everything's fiat in nature, it's rare to have something that's, um, I would say more commodity-based and fixed in value at the 21 million cap. So I always thought that was cool, the, um, the easy transferability across the world. So it, it's interesting, had my suspicions, but obviously, things are taking off right now pretty well. So Matt, maybe uh, you were eating pizza back in 2014 when the IRS issued their seminal guidance talking about how they viewed uh, crypto as a property and not a currency. Uh, that's kind of tax policy and the IRS doesn't usually get into tax policy. And I think in this case, they felt like there were uh, kind of enough, there was enough law out there related to property that they felt that uh, crypto felt in, crypto fell into those rules uh, better than the uh, currency rules. Yeah, so let's talk about the guidance that is out there and it's really in three categories in my view. Number one is uh, what the IRS has come out with. They, came, they have the 2014 notice, they came out with a 2019 ruling on airdrops that we'll talk about, forks and airdrops we'll talk about. And then they have a running list of Q&A on their website. The second uh, source of information, you know, like it or not, is the internet. And there are some pretty good summaries of tax consequences of cryptocurrency out there. We're going to link to one from Coinly, K-O-I-N-L-Y. Uh, they have a summary, a tax guide out there that I think does a, a good job of summarizing the application of current law to the some common and many common uh, crypto transactions and whether you like it or not i think that's the baseline and some people might view view things differently we'll talk about characterization issues timing issues um but i think that that summary is one of many that are out there and this this one does a fairly good job and then uh and of course the reddit forums you know people are very vocal about how they feel that uh, tax law is working or should work so that's uh, insightful if not authoritative and then finally uh we know how coinbase and others are reporting to their users coinbase has got four million active users it's got 40 million users overall they put a lot of thought into reporting and characterization of these payments and we know what they're doing is there anything else matt that you would point to or you look at with respect to your tax return or your clients? Well, I think you've summarized what's been the more authoritative and um, growing guidance that's not so authoritative from the IRS. You know, I encourage my clients to um, use a lot of these third-party service providers. There's lots of softwares out there, whether that's Bitcoin.tax, Cointracking.info, that'll either pull in through your exchanges, maybe read-only access, or you import data different ways 
that can help you determine your capital gains and losses. There's even companies like the Giving Block, which helps you make donations of appreciated property cryptocurrency and they provide a receipt for you. And lastly, you know, I tell my clients to build a basis schedule. And for non-accounting mm -hmm. folks out there, you might not know what that is, but it's important to build a basis schedule to know where you are. Have you invested more, recognized more tax than you've pulled out in distributions? And um, that's not a blanket of safety, but it, it certainly provides some assurance that you're, um, you're staying on the right side of the IRS. So man, let's talk about uh, buying and holding. If all you do in, or all you did in 2020 was that uh, you bought, you use dollars or fiat currency or real currency as the IRS likes to call it, to buy Bitcoin and you held the Bitcoin through 2020, uh, it's pretty simple, right? Absolutely, right. You know, if you haven't uh, sold anything, you have really nothing to report on the tax return. The, it's only the sale that's reportable, maybe in exchange to another currency, but if you're just buying and holding, um, there's a little bit of question out there whether you should be checking that nice new box on the front of the 1040, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's not a taxable event. Yeah, and the Q&A 5 was recently updated to say if you if, if all you did was to use fiat currency or real currency to buy Bitcoin, you don't, you don't have to check the box, but if you get an airdrop or if you stake and get some rewards, then that's not going to apply and you should be checking the box. I think that box is a good indicator of how far cryptocurrencies evolved in such a short period of time uh, from a tax standpoint, because I think when the IRS thought about that box three or four years ago, uh, cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency investors were viewed as kind of a secret society, you know, kind of a dark webby thing. And now um, having uh, cryptocurrency is like having a Netflix account. You know, it's become so retail. Uh, I think from my, from my calculations, I think around five to 10 million people are gonna check that box on Form 1040 this year. Let's talk about selling or exchanging. We'll jump to that. Um, if you have a taxable disposition of virtual currency, as you said, it's generally going to create capital gains based on the IRS's property characterization. If it goes down in value like 2018, you might end up with capital losses. That is not a good thing. Um, and the big question to me is like, when do you have a taxable event? And you have, Matt, some uh, guidance that says, for example, if you move a virtual currency between wallets or onto an exchange or off of an exchange, that is not a taxable disposition. Uh, if you stake a currency, if you delegate, if you lend a currency, that's not a taxable disposition. Is it taxable at this time is a very big issue. Is that on the mind of many of your clients? No, it certainly is. You know, I, I get a lot of um, clients when they're coming on board or maybe a prospect asking me, you know, telling me rather that all I did was ex exchange Bitcoin for Ripple or Cardano or Litecoin or something. And uh, so I have no tax effect and I have to remind them, no, they've actually made an exchange there and they do have a tax, taxable transaction to report. Yeah, and I think this is another element of the evolution of cryptocurrency taxation because in 2019, Coinbase reported uh, transactions on 1099K, which is more of a proceeds of, of, of sale. And the IRS in question and answer 38, when they talk about moving from wallet to wallet, says that these types of transactions are not taxable, even if you receive an information return from an exchange or platform that uh, as a result of the transfer. So it's interesting that the IRS, in effect, allows you to take some self-help to the extent you get a reporting form that's inconsistent with how you view your obligations to file your tax returns. Yep, it's it's also interesting. Um, I've had clients receive a 1099 miscellaneous for uh, services paid in cryptocurrency. A client worked as a consulting job and then was issued a 1099. And you know that didn't even reflect the economic reality of an illiquid token. So the, the, some of these reporting forms um, don't give you the whole story. Yeah, so let's uh, let's jump on to forks and airdrops now because I think while it's a kind of a narrow issue, it does a good job of uh, really teasing out the bigger issue of when do you have income, what's the value of that income, and as you said, the classic case: Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash airdrop, IRS question and answer twenty-three. If a hard fork is followed by an airdrop and you receive new cryptocurrency, you will have taxable income in the taxable year you receive that currency. So it seems pretty clear in this in this area. 
This was also the focus of Revenue Ruling 2019-24. And I think that ruling has the second most important statement ever made by the IRS in the cryptocurrency area. The first important statement or most important statement is cryptocurrency's property and it's not currency. But in this uh, Revenue Ruling 2019-24, they say under section 61, which is the gross income uh, section for tax purposes, all gains or undeniable accessions to wealth clearly realized over which a taxpayer has complete dominion are included in gross income. So it throws out a number of conditions in which you have to meet to have the taxable income. And what's interesting is that this is based, this, this is basically verbatim from a 1955 court case. And some people will actually go back to a 1920 court case on stock dividends and say that's a relevant authority. So it's it's kind of interesting that here we are with DeFi and all the kind of new emerging um, uses of crypto and we're looking at court cases like a century old to try to figure out what happened. You know, the as you mentioned, that came out in 2019. A lot of these issues were in 2017. Things move so quickly in the cryptocurrency space. In the Twitterverse, um, there, there's this joke that one month and to one week in, in crypto land is a year in, in the regular world. So things move so quickly, and you know the guidance is is um, behind schedule. This idea of what is it characterizing uh, the creation of tokens is a, a really big debated topic right now. So I might call I might I might say it's like farming marijuana. So when I pull that marijuana out of the field, I'm not taxable at that point in time. I'm taxable when I sell it. If I uh, bake a pot brownie or pop brownies, I'm not taxable when I take the tray out of the oven. I'm taxable if and when I sell those brownies. And farming and uh, baking are terms used for the creation of new tokens. And so you kind of question why tokens are being treated one way and farming or baking might be treated another way. And for people that like have an opinion on this, no matter how you characterize it, you're going to really, uh, it, it's inflammatory to kind of half the people that are out there. And they might say, no, this is like, um, this is like you're getting paid uh, tokens for services. So you're providing a service to the network to maintain it. And then you're getting a token and the value of the token becomes taxable income. And some people might say, no, this is like you're walking on a, on a beach with a metal detector and you find a gold coin. You know, and it's kind of uh, all kinds of characterizations out here. This that characterization issue is probably the biggest issue, debated issue in all of cryptocurrency tax. And this year, that is going to be a there are going to be some very significant developments um, about that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to staking. So, so, so Matt, what do you? What do you think about in characterization? We might as well piss off the other 50% of the people watching. <laughs> so um, certainly I, I get the argument for services, right? You are securing the network when you're mining. And, um, you know, I don't have many clients mining these days in 2021, 2017. It was still possible to um, maybe through a cloud mining contract or, or setting some rigs at home that you could possibly mine another token, not Bitcoin. Yep. There is ambiguity in the in, in the space right now, and um, we obviously see the IRS's position, and um, be interesting to see how this goes to tax court um, or any other body. Just to understand where uh, where things are going to land. We mentioned uh, mining Bitcoin. Let's talk about those proof of work currencies uh, now. And uh, mining Bitcoin is actually addressed all the way back in Notice 2014-21. And what, what they say is when a taxpayer successfully mines virtual currency, and that's in quotes, the fair market value of the virtual currency as of the date of receipt is includable in gross income. And the guidance also says this could be a trader business subject to self-employment tax. I think a lot of people that mine or still mine proof of work currencies want to be in that trader business so they can deduct these crazy high utility costs and the cost of their rig. And as you say, uh, Matt, there are fewer individual proof of work miners out there today. It's become more of a big business, uh, China Inc. or Riot Blockchain. Riot Blockchain is a company out in Colorado. They are in the process of deploying 15,000 mining stations. So I think the proof of work mining has moved off to the bigger companies. What we have now at a retail basis is a lot more proof of stake 
uh, farmers, fishers, bakers, whatever you want to call them. So let's talk about proof of stake um, because that I think is where this characterization um, issue really uh, come, comes forward. And Matt, I think it has to do with people who, uh, you know, I hear people say I'm getting a 12% uh, yield or a 20% return on my staking. How, how do you perceive that from a tax standpoint? Well, certainly um, from a tax standpoint now, the guidance is light, but we are treating it as taxable income in the year um, received, just kind of like proof of work mining. Um, just based on the limited guidance we have right now, a conservative position is to treat it that way. But there, uh, as you're alluding to, there's some other arguments in place that uh, perhaps it's not income until you uh, divest of the property. Yeah, and, and when you say that's kind of how you're treating it, I will tell you that's uh, apparently how Coinbase is treating it too with respect to their reporting forms. They're reporting it on 1099 uh, MISC, M-I-S-C, as kind of an amorphous ordinary income. So it's not, it's not dividends, it's not rent, it's not royalty. Uh, it's just kind of this amorphous income that some people look at as from services and associated with the trader business. I think that the issue, and I don't want to talk about proof of stake too much here because there are going to be some major developments in this area uh, this year. And I think a lot more, there's going to be a lot more illumination on this issue. But uh, how I see it playing out, I mean, there's, there's a potential uh, big negative here. And people have pointed this out before. Even some members of Congress have written a letter to the IRS saying, hey, it's possible that people that are staking could be forced into, in a sense, led into reporting, over-reporting income in the year they get an award. And the idea is that if you're uh, receiving a staking award, you're getting a new token, but that new token is diluting all of the value of everybody that already holds tokens, including your own legacy tokens. And so you're reporting the entire value of the token you're receiving. You're not able to reduce that, or at least generally, I think it's in the market, not being reduced by the di di diminution of your existing tokens. And so you may be reporting too much ordinary income upfront, possibly self-employment income. And then later on, when you sell your legacy tokens, you're gonna end up with a capital loss. So you got ordinary income upfront, possible self-employment taxes, capital losses at the back end. I think a lot of people view this as a problem with the way that the tax laws currently work. I, I would certainly agree with that. You know, there you look at the dollar this year and there's anywhere of estimates in 2020, the dollar supply grew from 15 to 35 percent. Right. So there's certainly the dilution of your value there. You don't add a capital loss um, and then there's no ordinary income. There, there is that ordinary income component. But uh, regardless, there's are some inconsistencies between what uh, is considered a cryptocurrency versus a fiat currency uh, in that property selection. Let's shift to another very hot topic now, and that is non-fungible tokens. Um, William Shatner just turned 90 years old. He sold 125,000 personal trading cards at, in the form of non-fungible tokens. And so basically what he did is he took 125,000 old photographs. So like he and uh, Spock, where he's got the Spock ears on instead of uh, 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 Spock, Leonard Nimoy. And he took those old photographs, he digitized them, and he put hash masks on them. And then he sold essentially the um, hash mask key so that whoever bought the key could then unmask them and view them. And he made a lot of money doing that, they sold out. So that's uh, pretty amazing. The tax consequences, and this is a very new area, but uh, the tax consequences could depend on whether you're treated as an artist, a hobbyist, an investor, a dealer. Have you started to think about these issues, man, from a tax standpoint? From a tax standpoint, I haven't come across it yet. I'm expecting to soon. It's um, it's good enough for Captain Kirk. It's good enough for me. <laughs> um, it's funny. I was, uh, you know, Twitter is the best source of information on so much of this stuff right now. And just the last couple of days, I saw Elon Musk um, on Twitter sharing a new song he was turning into an NFT, and um, it, it, it's pretty neat. Um, some of the big names that are, are are getting into this market. Yeah, and the tax consequences can be really confusing. So, if I take a Bitcoin and I put a hash mask on it and I sell it, am I selling art or am I selling a Bitcoin? And I think that these characterization issues 
are already big enough when it comes to when do I have taxable income and what kind of taxable income is it. I think you throw NFTs in the pot and it really uh, begs for a kind of universal uh, perspective, you know, and one that doesn't necessarily rely on century-old court cases to reach the uh, conclusion. In terms of copywriting, and, and what rights do you have to this going forward and the underlying, you know, if they're making an NFT token, uh, NFT for a song, uh, what rights do you have to that? And it's just going to be a really new, interesting area of, of, uh, of law, possibly. Let's talk about some of the bad things that can happen in the crypto space. So um, you could be hacked, you could lose a private key, or you could like attend a cryptocurrency conference in Las Vegas, which takes some money out of your wallet. What, um, Matt, how do you uh, advise clients who have had one of these uh, bad things occur, or how do you advise clients that want to write off that trip to Las Vegas? <laughs> Well, in terms of the loss, um, you know, a lot of folks don't understand that you're limited to lower of um, usually your basis, right? So if you bought Bitcoin for $10,000 and today it's $55,000 and you lose your private key or it's stolen or something like that, you know, in their mind, they're out $55,000 and economically fair market value. That's true. But they're, if their basis is only $10,000, that's what their loss is limited to. You know, there's certainly lots of exchanges that have gone under. I've had some prospects who are, um, I hate to say scammed, where they were depositing mm. their, mm. their their coins on an exchange that uh, was not going to be giving them back. So there's certainly um, losses to be had. It's just to understand that your basis is, um, is the limit there. Yeah, and I think it's interesting when you talk about like the uh, type of conferences that people have and people attend and maybe now more so kind of if the pandemic eases continues to ease a bit but the IRS way back in 2014 uh, essentially said like the mining of Bitcoin even mining one token might be a trader business might be subject to self-employment tax that kind of opens the door in a case of proof of staking which you know in a sense uh, maybe a little bit more maybe a little bit less active than proof of work but it would seem to open the door to be in a trader business and look at some of these deductions as an important deduction or uh, ordinary and necessary to the creation of wealth via staking or other uh, activity in this area. Certainly, and I would argue, you know, there's other expenses, whether it's your internet, a VPN to do things securely or mm -hmm. um, you know, have some allocation to a business like this. In conclusion, because we're going to wrap it up here, there are many open questions searching for guidance. If you have questions on the tax treatment of your cryptocurrency, reach out to Matt, me, leave a comment. If you like this video, smash the like button and subscribe. This has been Taking Shelter. I'm your host, Peter Paulson.